Welcome to A Thousand and One Ways to Cope with Stress. I am Professor Kinshasa Shabaka, and we are now entering number four of our fantastic journey with the excellent presentation by Dr. Frederick Munderson to the Temple of Luxor. It is an absolutely phenomenological, existential experience. Just listening to you and visualizing this magnificent structure, which I've had the wonderful pleasure of experiencing, but I'm experiencing it anew with your explanations and your rendition of the tremendous, meticulous research and knowledge that you share with us. We thank you, Dr. Anderson, for part four of the Thank lecture. you, Professor, for having me. Uh, it's uh, it's also always a pleasure to be in your company. And in, in, in some respects, you help to motivate and bring out uh, a lot of what I'm able to explain. So uh, there's a double purpose of our getting together, our sitting down and our presenting to uh, our audience. Uh, I want to call this segment number four uh, the esoteric symbolism of Luxor Temple. Uh, if you recall, in the first part I began, you know, beginnings and endings uh, are, are not necessarily uh, finite. Uh, but I began uh, the first part with reading that poem to Luxor Temple. And um, I would like to begin this fourth part by reading a poem that uh, Charlotte de Lubis had wrote in ending his two volume uh, Temple of Man. Uh, um, in essence, he, he has written, and he entitles this poem, The Unity. One sole truth, indivisible unity, one sole reality, the verb and its evolution in consciousness, one sole universal morality, to cosmic man, each is bound to all, each is responsible for or benefits from the good and the evil deeds of all. Humanity is a whole united in the individual. One soul consciousness, Genesis. One soul pure science, Numbers. One soul expression, the symbol. One soul means harmony, which has a source in disorder, where the sundered parts rediscover one another, naturally and of themselves through affinity. Spirit is at the beginning and end of all form. Form is a symbol of a function. Wisdom is the perfect harmony of all the functions. So, my poem, uh, in essence, brings us into an explanation of the esoteric symbolism of the Temple of Luxor. This esoteric symbolism of Luxor Temple is explained in the building of the temple, the structure of the, or architectural layout of the subject. The kings who worshipped in and those who did repairs to it and affixed their names to inform posterity of the significance of this classical peer piece of new kingdom architecture. To this we may add the purpose of the temple, the functions performed therein, as well as the temple's survivability into the modern world of Thor's interface and the ongoing work of construction, restoration, mapping, and preservation of uh, one of the most magnificent creations of Pharaonic praise of their deity. Though many temples, worship temples, were built in Egypt, very few were built by a single individual and dedicated to a single deity. The Temple of Luxor falls within this select category, and though additions were made within the select category, additions were made to its general plan, these were designed to further the intent and purpose of the original design. The original design was to create a living entity where the God can come and feel comfortable in his home. 
A hallmark of Egyptian temple construction was to raise a new temple either in the vicinity of an earlier or in the site of a previous construction that had earlier been consecrated. That is to say, very seldom, uh, in the case of Ahmed Hote the, the, the Ford, the revolutionary, the son of the builder of Luxor Temple, he was at war, sort of, with the deities of his time. And he moved to, he erected a new city out in the desert, and he reconsecrated a temple. But for the most part, all of the temples throughout the 42 gnomes of Egypt were in some way built on some location that was earlier, in earlier times, consecrated, so that a temple would be built on top of a temple. If you go to Dendera, even Luxor, uh, uh, Edfu, I mean, you will see that there is, that temple sits on top of a colonnade. The, uh, remember in the beginning we also said that how the, with the inundation, the river covers the land and the land itself raises something like three inches every hundred years. So that particular temple, Edfu, which dates back to mythical times and the struggle of Osiris and his brother Set, and the, 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 he murders Osiris and Osiris's son Horus uh, claims the throne and fights and defeats his, his, his uncle and he builds a temple on the spot where the final battle occurred. So it is argued that that temple may have been 10,000 years old. We're not sure for, for fact. But I was taken to a location in the temple and shown the top of a colony where this temple is, is, sits on top of it. Now, if you can imagine, and you will see some of this in the in, 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 the, in the photographs of the colonnades of uh, Luxor Temple, and you see how high they are. And imagine a temple being built on top of that. So, uh, you know, we're talking about an extensive duration of time and construction uh, and the emergence of simple building to monumental structures where science is perfected and the mind of man expands and elevates itself uh, providing of course they have a mission that is designed to do good and uh, we come back to the whole notion of good and evil and the Africans have always been on the side of good yeah. So, so the hallmark of uh, Egyptian temple construction was to raise a new temple either in the vicinity of an early erection or on the site of a previous construction that had already been sacralized. Case in point, Flinders Petrie discovered at Abydos ten successive layers of temples, which dates back to the time of the first dynasty. Now, the the Pharaonic. Egypt lasted for 3,000 years. So, and the interesting thing is some of the great rulers of the most ancient periods had worshiped and left evidence of their being at that temple, uh, which, uh, you know, was covered over a period of time and temple built on temple on temple and so forth. So I mean if we look at if we look at the, the rise of the of the of, of the of the surface at three cent three inches uh, uh, a century and you're talking about thirty centuries. So you're looking at uh, an enormous uh, time span. A time span but also uh, a significant uplift of the land mass and uh, because you know with the inundation of the river, uh, the 
the land not only rose, but it was naturally fertilized. And uh, the, the and farmers... Consecrated. <laughs> uh, yes, and, and the farmers were able to, uh, were, were able to at least have two, 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 two harvests, sometimes a third harvest, okay? But, but um, uh, they, 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 they um, of course, you had to work at it, you know, but, um, uh, and then there was uh, artificial irrigation. But the point is that the, 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 the rivers overflow, naturally fertilize the land. Now, with the creation of the low dam and then the high dam, with the high dam that created uh, Lake Nassau, uh, the natural fertilization of the land ceased to occur. And now the Egyptians are have to manufacture fertilizer. The benefit was that they were able to get hydroelectric potential to for economic development. But there was a downside to that. And there was even a, another downside because the creation of the, the high dam created what is called Lake Nassau. Lake Nassau, which meant that a lot of the water that was lost that ran into the Mediterranean was now retained and released over a period of time. However, it created this lake, Lake Nassau, named after the president who inaugurated it. Okay, what it did, however, is that it inundated many of the Nubian ancestral lands and the temples that they built. So what had happened was in the 1960s, UNESCO appealed to nations that had had uh, a history of Egyptian archaeology to say, well, listen, we need you to help us to save some of these temples. Many of the temples were removed and placed on higher ground. For example, Abu Simbel, uh, Kalapsha, Dender. Dender was brought, was dismantled and brought to the United States and, and placed in the Museum of uh, uh, Nat Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's a small temple. But many of the other temples were placed on high ground. However, the United States sent a team from the University of Chicago headed by a gentleman named Keith Sell, S-E-E-L-E. -E. He made an important discovery and not reported, but he secreted the results in the basement of the University Museum, University of Chicago's museum. And he passed on. Ivan Van Sertima, the great scholar, said that he had hoped to carry the secret to his grave. A graduate student, Bruce Williams, doing research, I call it mining the basement. M I N I N G, mining, looking for information, looking for hidden knowledge, discovered what turns out to be what the New York Times of 1971 published, an article entitled World's Earliest Monarchy Found in Nubia. The earliest example of kingship. Whereas the king wearing the white crown sitting on the throne in a boat with an incense burner and several other palace facade, the front of a palace and what have you. What it does say is that this notion of kingship that we experience and we begin to chronicle from Nama's unification with the, through the Nama pilot, remember Nama pilot where the goddess Hathor is uh, on the pilot and the pilot indicated the king being wearing the red and white crown and uh, emphasizing the unification of the country. We see this 200, at least two, 300 years earlier in Nubia, but it doesn't get any play. What we are told is that quote unquote, for some unknown reason, Caucasian people left the Caucasus region 
and came to Egypt. They didn't bring anything, end of quote. They didn't bring anything except, quote unquote again, a superior mental attitude. That is to say, they came and found that these people, these Africans, had already invented the wheel. So they tried to reinvent the wheel. But as Professor Clark likes to say, we were systematically narrated out of the process of history by saying the Africans never contributed anything to civilization. These people came like bakers. You know what a baker does? A baker comes in with empty hands and he finds the flour and the ingredients on the table and he works it and he puts it in the oven. They came in as bakers. But the evidence and the, the again, again, Dr. Diab has <clears throat> said that the waters of historical inquiry have been so muddied by Europeans claiming Egypt that it is difficult. Only by painstaking research can we put together credible cogent arguments to show that the Africans were the ones who initiated all forms of knowledge, whether it, it is spiritual knowledge, scientific knowledge, physical knowledge, or intellectual knowledge. I mean, the claim that the Greeks invented uh, uh, philosophy is falsity. Okay, architecture. The, the colonnade that we're talking about, the colonnade was invented in Egypt at Saqqara 2800. It was never invented or it never developed in, in Asia or uh, anywhere else until about maybe 1200 or later. <laughs> so the, 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 the discovery in, uh, and, and if you remember, I had mentioned the people of Napta Playa who were the first inventors of science, first scientists. You ask a youngster, who was the first scientist? Uh, what's his name? Uh, this guy, the American guy, uh, the, the American, famous American scientist, uh, you know, A, B, A, A equals B, B, C, plus E equals C square. Uh, Einstein? Einstein, right? <laughs> I mean, Isn't we. Done before? Uh, but these <laughs> are the people who invented science. No. They mapped the heavens, okay. And when their land began to to desiccate, to dry up, and there's no more rainfall because in that period there was, that area was was heavily raining. Mm -hmm. uh, they 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 migrated to the to the Nile, and they were probably the people who invented who uh who were. The discoverers of who the discovery found at uh, the place called Custom. Mm -hmm. So let me let me move on with this here, right? So uh, we know that um, uh, uh, so to raise the new temple. So we, we, we want to believe that uh, there, there, was, uh, there was an earlier temple at Luxor, certainly by Middle Kingdom. But there may have been an even earlier temple that dates back to the beginnings of science, beginnings of dynastic rule. Because you see, uh, we are told that Karnak Temple is an example. Every gnome in, in some way had their own deity that they, that they worshipped. And uh, the deity to worship him had to have some house for him to occupy. We're told that Karnak Temple uh, was uh, what we found was that there was a uh, there were some columns in the uh, Middle Kingdom court behind the sanctuary at Karnak. So we're told that, and they were dated at 2000. So we're told that Karnak only began in 2000 BC. However, there is evidence that Karnak was one of the founding temples as early as the beginning of dynastic rule of 3000. So if, if, if Karnak was, uh, was, was invented then, 
certainly Luxor. But we know that by the Middle Kingdom, there was something there. Now, by the 18th dynasty, the New Kingdom, Amenhotep had dismantled that, and he decided to build this new temple. You see, the thing is that uh, these Africans, uh, if we go to Oxford University, they never dismantle. They build on top of Okay, But generally, uh, a king may seek to, in Egypt, may seek to build a greater piece of work and systematically would dismantle, not bulldoze as, let's say, conquerors coming in and decide to destroy the temple, as perhaps what happened to Luxor. You remember I said that the Open Air Museum had all these thousands of pieces which showed that somebody came in there with a, a mallet and started breaking up the whole temple, well, despite what, what we see today, because Earlier, I also said that um, the, today the temple looks majestic, but if, despite the, the 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 destruction of time and man, imagine what it would have looked like when it was first commissioned. Okay, the God would. I don't know if the God would want to live in it today because uh, it's so uh, uh, out of out of. Um, out of character, I would say. But still, it is a wonderful piece that in reflecting, and again, like we also said earlier, it is not for us to project what we know and what we believe, but to learn from what the ancients want to teach us. So the Temple of Luxor was, uh, uh, was dedicated to Amun-Ra, king of the gods, as a private harem away from the increasingly crowded Karna Temple so that God could vacation with his wife, the goddess Moot. Uh, thus, the purpose of the construction of the Temple of Luxor was to celebrate the World Festival, where for a period of time, amid great fanfare, frolic, and festivity, the divine couple would remain enamored in their private apartment while the adherents celebrated outside. However, we come to realize there is a higher esoteric divine purpose in bringing the God from the heavens to occupy his house. Sexual encounter of the gods is an increasing issue. Dr. Ben Johanna has said much about this phenomenon in his efforts at clarification. Evidence indicates Hatshepsut inaugurated many cultural festivities and factors that once standardized became enshrined practice throughout the remainder of dynastic rule. In this vein, she recognized the potency of Amun's sexual appetite and declared it manifested in the story of her divine birth. Here the god appeared to her mother, Mutel Kriya, as re re recounted on the Derebari temple. And the, 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 the god appeared in a flash of light and perfume, and encountered and enamored her mother. The depiction recounts all the gods involved from the introduction of the couple, the accoutrement of the impregnation through the delivery process, and finally the presentation of the child of the god, his father. Uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I often do not discuss my secret name. Uh, I mean, I was, uh, I was doing my name at Carnic Temple, and I was given, I was baptized at Luxor. Uh, I'm told the story of my family. My grandmother said that our father, our ancestor, he, um, in the Caribbean, he rode a horse. And somewhere along the line, one of them, the ladies, she carried the baby to this guy sitting on the horseback and said, this is your child. And he looked at it and he nodded and he, that time they had these, I think it's two shilling or 50 cent piece and he threw his, you know, you know our, our history because of the slave experience is different to most others, mm -hmm. but he recognized. So what had happened is that after the, the child is born, yeah. she is presented to the God, and he looks up and says, yeah, it's mine. <laughs> you know, and this is recounted on her temple at the Ramar, across the river. This divine bird, some call divine uh, uh, virgin bird, served her ships as well. So she used that to justify her right to, to rule. It's the same thing that he did, I mean, Hote because she was more or less a descendant from, you see, the, the thing is that the, the, the woman carried the divine genes, and her 
grandmother, which was Ames Nefertari, she was divine. Okay? So she had a legitimate claim to the throne. Still, she said, my father is not my father. The God is my father. So now, here comes Amenhotep the third, and he too was of questionable birth because his father, his grand, great-grandfather was her sister, but he was from uh, uh, a concubine, not in the direct line. Like, we call it outside child, right? So he used the same strategy that she used to justify his right to rule, to say that I am the child of the God. And he had a special room just between the Hypostyle Hall and the sanctuary where everything is illustrated how he became a child of divine birth. So uh, uh, Dr. Ben used uh, the, the, the example of men uh, whose uh, sexual organ, or you call it the creative organ, is shown prominently because these Africans recognize that you don't get no child until you sit down, uh, you get together, right? So, but his creative organ comes out of his navel, not his scrotum. So there is a difference in terms of conception of divine as opposed to human intercourse for the creation of the young. And when you say illustrated, you meant Hieroglyphics? Yes, it's on the walls yes, of, yes. Uh, of, 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 of the stem. Yes. Right. So, uh, in addition to the reciprocal relationship of divine transmission and building a temple to the God, the Temple of Luxor was also an intellectual repository of academic learning and transmission of knowledge, as well as creating and propagating the metaphysical te teachings of secret wisdoms as per the Masonic.